All right, welcome back. So we've almost come to the end of this chapter. Let's look at practical ways how we can implement this to make the local church a place of community, a place of belonging. Uh, one is create a sense of belonging uh, within the house of God. The local church should be more than a place where people attend service. It should remember the son and the servant mentality. The son doesn't come home only to get food and sleep. He belongs there. Same way, you and I, we belong to the local church. We serve in the local church. We're not doing God a favor. Yes? right. When we are waking up early in the morning, sound and setup team, going early, 6 a.m., they're not doing God a favor. But they will be honored for their hard work. They do it because they belong to the church. They belong to the family. Now, is it easy? I really appreciate the sound and setup team here at, at APC because it's not easy. Nobody knows who, who they are. They are not brought on the stage and say, OK, well done, sound and setup. No. But when you go there, everything is set up. There's so much of hard work that they go through. Now, they do it because they belong to the church. Right? There's no grumbling, murmuring while doing it. Right? They do it because they belong. And even as we, we uh, as a church, we, we must come to that place of belonging. So we do things because we like to do it. Encourage people to serve with the son mentality and not as a servant mentality. Encourage people to grow up to become fathers. Wonderful, right? Imagine you got a 25-year-old. You're encouraging him. It's 10 years. He's 35. Naturally, also, he's become a father. And now he's also ready to raise up maybe teens and youth to become good leaders and he's be able to speak into their lives as well. Develop true Christian community. This takes time, but it is necessary. You understand this? Christian community takes time. Don't expect to start a local church and in one week or, uh, or in uh, maybe two, three months, everyone should you know uh, have that feeling of community. Not always. Listen, there will be some people who will come into your local church, immediately feel like home. There will be some, some of them who need time. They may take one year, they may take five years to build that community. So remember, when you're dealing with people in a local church, people are different. They don't have the same mindset. When we bring correction to somebody, one person may say, same correction. One person may say, OK, thank you, Pastor. I'll change that. Another person may say, how can he say this to me? Another person may say, oh, I feel bad, but I think what he said is right. But he has something in his heart. You don't know. Another person may say, oh, yeah, no, I did this wrong. Thank you, Pastor, for telling me. So we don't know uh, what kind of you know, uh, temperament or what is their character. We are dealing with pe different kinds of people. So building community takes time. Right now, when I came from uh, Mangalore, after four years, I came and I came to APC East, which is in Whitefield. There were a lot of new faces, but a lot of faces who I already knew who were there from church for many, many, many years. So I used to go and talk to the ones who I already knew, the older folks, the people who have been with APC for many years. Say, how do we, you know, build relationships? How do we, you know, a lot of people are coming in who are new to the city because it's just after COVID. All our regular, you know, worshippers have gone back to their hometowns and they've settled. Now we're getting a new group of people after COVID. Jobs are opening. People are coming from different cities, coming to Bangalore. Now they're coming to church as well. So how do we connect with them? How do we? So we used to meet. We used to talk. We used to, and now it takes time to build that community. Right, and now it's been two years, so we have like a strong community. Right, right? people are now again. That's going to continue. Right, uh, every week we may have new families. I can't expect. See, there are some families who came to church. Immediately, the moment they get into church, they have you know connected with people immediately. But there are some of them who come into church, and then it takes time for them to really get into. Uh, building a community so take time right develop true christian community among ministry specific team this is very powerful 
Now, within a church, you have teams. That helps. Ushering team, welcome team, sound and setup team. Get people involved in teams. Now, the moment you're in the team, you've already, you know, you're building community, you're building friendships, right? Life group, you're building friendships, right? So it's not only Sunday service. Right? For example, some of the men in our men's ministry, some of our men, they go on a Saturday early morning. They all go to a certain place, to a park. They do jogging, exercises, go have breakfast, spend some time, stay till about 11 o'clock in the morning. They go early mornings, 6.37, about three, four hours. Exercise, have a good breakfast, go back home, building fellowship, building community. This is apart from church, right? Now, challenges to be prepared for. Every, not everyone who are part of the local church may see the need to be spiritually connected. Have you seen people who attend church and by the time you say Amen, they're not there? Right? You've given the benediction, Amen, they, they've gone. Why? They don't feel the need. Now, it's not like they're wrong. Right? It's a challenge. And it's, a, it's something that we should take it up as a challenge and say, hey, how can we connect with them? Now, there may be a young couple, right? They've come to church. It's a big church, 500 people. Oh, I feel lost here. But as leaders, as a community, I must be willing to see, okay, this is a young couple. They've come to Bangalore. They've come from a ministry background. They attend a church in maybe a different city. So why, how can I get them connected to church? I need to first see if I can you know, connect them to a life group. There are many times when we have identified people like this, young couples especially, and you know we see them, hey, they've already been part of a church for many years, right? serving also in their previous church. So we immediately get them connected to a life group, give them about six to eight months or at least a year, and then we make them life group leaders. So that you know they understand, see, the way cell group is done in their church, the way life group is done in our church is different. So this one year, they understand what is APC, what is the vision, how do we function, what is the culture. They learn it, and eventually we help them to become leaders. Right? But there are sometimes people take five years, 10 years, still they don't want to be leaders. Now, it's not wrong, but we must. it's a challenge that we must help people with. Uh, in large churches with uh, several hundreds in the congregation, it is easy to feel disconnected and lost. That's true. That's why we have to come up with teams, something that we follow in APC. We have connect team, we have life group teams, um, of course, youth teams. Just trying to you know, get everyone involved. You may be in a different part of the city, get involved. Right? Uh, so for example, the youth, the youth are all over the place, right? So we have youth boys life group, youth girls life group, youth have a lot of meetings that they have, you know, youth missions, youth monthly youth meetings, right? Sam can give you more details on that, but, but there's so many things happening so they can get connected, right? So it's available for everyone. We don't say only Richmond Town people come here or only these people come. No, anyone can come. You're in the age bracket, come. You know English, you don't know English, come. You come. You, you are part of the church, you come. And we, uh, as a church, thankfully, right, we, we don't look at people by what they do, how they speak. No, it doesn't matter to us. You are part of our family, you are part of the church, you come. Connect with us. Now, that's the most we can do. right? Now, as a youth pastor, Sam cannot go to every house and knock. Please come, we have youth meeting. He, he cannot do that. He cannot afford to do that. But these are things that are there to help the youth get connected. Same way, life groups. There are life groups. Get connected. These are the options. Go on your website. Go on the website. These are the different options. So every Sunday announcement, you will see life groups on the announcements. Every Sunday, we are better together, right? Connected. So people know. Oh, there are life groups. How do I get connected? Different ways. You can call us in the church office. You can go to the website. You can register. You can just call, email one of our pastors. Many ways 
to get connected. Now we have something called as get connected. They can sign up and say, I want to be a part of a life group. And we will follow up with them. All you have to do is show interest, and we are ready. And sometimes, as leaders, we have to give them a slight push. Come on, you can do it. That's our part. Uh, so these are uh, challenges. One more challenge here, danger of uh, people forming cliches and el elite groups. Now, groups are important, right? Uh, groups are important within the church. Groups are important, but groupism is wrong. Right? We have a lot of groups. We have teams, badminton team, football team. They all go and they play. They make groups, they go play. But there's no groupism. Anybody can join. Anybody can join. Well, there's no groupism. There's no, you know, you only if you're fit into this criteria. Only if you have attended church for three weeks, you can join. No, nothing like that. Anyone can join. Part of APC, you've even attended once, you can join. Right? So making groups is good. Groupism is wrong. But there are times when this can happen if we are not careful. You know, groupism or just setting apart, you know, having groups in different places and having your own agendas. That could be that could be wrong, right? So let's get into the next chapter. Now, the first one, the local church. Uh, so remember, there are about 10 pillars, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so we looked at first one, the local church, the body of Christ. Then we looked at the family of God, uh, the local church, the family of God. So chapter 10, the pillar of truth is the third aspect, right, as a church. Now. First Timothy chapter three verse fifteen. Let's read that. Anyone can read that, please. First Timothy three fifteen. Yeah. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the earth, truth. Which is the church, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now I've used this example many times, right? When you have a when you have to build a big structure, what is the first thing you need? Foundation. Why is the foundation needed? So that you build pillars. You can you start off the pillar on ground level? Oh, I'm gonna build uh, 10 floors, so let me start the pillar. Pillar is there. I'll start from here only. I'll I'll dig three feet down and start the pillar. Is it going to work? No. The ground needs to be dug, then the pillar is built. So Paul is using that imagery here. He's saying, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Now, the local church is the pillar and the ground of truth, the upholder, the standard bearer, the foundation of truth in a, in a corrupt world. You and I, are the salt. We are the truth. And when we go, we impact the world. The church is the pillar of truth. So as a pillar of truth, what is it that we must do? Right. So we're looking at this now. John 17, 17. We are aligned and committed to the truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, the local church must be aligned and committed to the word of God, the truth. It is the word of God that helps us get a good foundation. So you imagine this. You plant a local church. Evangelism, events, conferences, all of that is important. But not as important of teaching the truth of God's word. Because what does the word do? John 17. The sanctify them. Jesus, Jesus is praying for his disciples. He's saying, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So as pastors and leaders of local church, we must be uncompromising in teaching, ministering, and upholding the word of God unashamedly. 
we when asked to speak about current issues we speak in boldness we speak in confidence upholding what god's word says if someone comes up to me and asks does god i am i am a, i am gay does god love me i'll say yes god loves you but he hates that sin that you are committing and he wants to change your life i have to uphold the truth does god love you yes he loves you he loves you just as the way he loves me the truth of your god's word is god so loved the world that he gave you are part of the world he loves you very simple but there is sin you are not living in obedience to god's word so he despises he hates that sin that you are living in but there's a remedy if you confess your sins he is faithful and just to forgive you so he can change your life so what am i doing in a world where people have different opinions i'm holding on to god's word i'm understanding the person what they're going through but i'm also not deviating from the truth i'm saying what you're saying what you're doing is wrong but god has a remedy for this god can change your life uphold the truth be aligned and committed to the truth you know i would always say this as a, as leaders learn to get into god's word this is your foundation your gift is not your foundation you understand this your gift and your talent cannot be a foundation it is something that is helps you it's like the wall surrounding the pillars but it's not the pillar gifts can be acquired gifts can be lost in the sense it cannot be nurtured if it's not nurtured it's just going to be dormant but the truth of god's word is what we need as leaders go back to god's word ask god to speak to you through the word it is this truth that can help you and i stand and then when you raise up your own local church or local community church community life group whatever you're doing make sure that the word of god is being taught right because it's the word that penetrates it's the word that can change people we can say a thousand things but one word of god from the scriptures can change a person's life right so be aligned and committed to the truth raise up people who will be upholders of the truth john 17 15 through 19 i do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one they are not of the world just as i am not of the world sanctify them by your truth your word is truth and you sent me into the world i also have sent them into the world and for their sakes i sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth look at jesus so powerfully he's saying this he's speaking he's praying to the father he's saying father i'm not praying that you take them out of this world keep them in this world but as you keep them safe from the evil one they are not of the world just as i'm not of the world sanctify them by your truth your word is truth what is our responsibility as leaders my responsibility your responsibility as leaders in a local church is to keep preaching teaching the word of god week after week after week after week whether people like it or no you preach the word if you have assigned 45 minutes to preach preach now don't have a local church with 45 minutes worship 15 minutes testimony 15 minutes announcements and 10 minutes word because it's time up you know what will happen the church will have no foundation it will be a weak church and you will not be able to raise up leaders who will uphold the truth so make sure that as we raise up leaders you raise up people who will you know hold on to the truth of god's word now 
every Sunday, the more we preach, we preach, the truth will minister to them. They'll go back to their workplaces, wherever they are working. They will uphold the truth. They will uphold, hey, I heard this in church that, you know, for example, money laundering is wrong. Bribing is wrong. So I heard this in church. So I, I don't want to be somebody who will bribe others or cheat others or deceive others because that's, I learned on Sunday. Pastor preached about it. Or I learned in a life group. Life group leader said it's in God's word. And we read the word. So I don't want to do this. You see what's happening? Now you would have preached and they, you would have gone home and you're preparing for next Sunday. But the word is still ministering to that person. And he's going to his workplace and upholding the truth of God's word. Right? Our, our role is to empower, to equip people in God's word. It's the word that can change people's lives. Nowadays, people are, not everyone, but many times I've, I've noticed that people make their gifts and their skills as the foundation of their ministry. Or even the, the, the ministry is the foundation of their lives. No. The word is the foundation of the ministry. Yes? Right? So this is very important. Biju says, as a leader of the church, how to manage believers with different educational and cultural backgrounds and bring them to the spirit-driven environment and on one page? Yes, that's a good question, Biju. See, we will have people from different... Uh, cultural backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, different levels of, uh, you know, even in the workplace, you may have people who are CEOs, then you may also have people who are just, uh, you know, simple workers, daily workers. Now, how do I bring them together? One important way is as a leader, firstly, I should teach what God's word says. What does the word say? We are all seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Now, in the world, I may be a CEO, but when I look at somebody else who's just you know, stepping into the corporate world, I should not look down upon them, but I should be in a place of saying, hey, how can I help this person? Right? Now, that can come in only by teaching of God's word. Number one, teach the word. So when we teach the word, we'll be able to, people will be, especially people from different cultures and different uh, educational qualifications or different levels in, their, in society, right? Uh, they will understand, hey, this is, as believers, we are one. Two is how you as a leader respond and treat each and every one. This is very important. If Remember James talks about it. He says, if a person comes to you in good clothing, don't give them a front, you know, a front row seat. And then if a, a person who is, you know, uh, coming in with torn clothes and don't tell them go sit at the back. That's what showing favoritism. So God doesn't show favoritism. So it starts with you and I as a leader. When I look at a person, this person who may be just entering the corporate world and a CEO working in a company, right? For me, I should treat them equally. Now, they both have different skills, right? Now, the CEO of a company may have better skills. He learned, He knows how to talk well. He knows how to do things well. Uh, he has better grasping abilities. He's able to teach. So I give him opportunities to, you know, to either share, to teach, whenever required. But this person who's just joined in may not have that ability yet. But as a leader, I should ensure that this person also grows in the Lord. I should not put all my focus on the CEO and overlook this person, this young man who's just joined. Right? So one is through the word, Biju. Two is by our example of not showing favoritism. And people will watch that and they will understand, hey, pastor or the leader of the church is like this. So even I should be like this. And people will watch and learn. Okay. Three, beware of compromise. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. John six, John 17, 16. Compromise. As pastors and leaders, we will face pressures. 
to be soft, nice, not to be too forceful. Sometimes we don't want to rock the boat, so to speak, but we must be aware of compromise. Listen, we are we are not of this world, but we when we make decisions, when we uh, when we look at the church, especially, we must ensure that we are not compromising the truth. The salt loses its saltiness; it's of no use. You can't take a lamp and put it under the table. It's not going to bring any light to the room. So if we go about compromising, we will be in a place where we will not make a difference. We will not be able to bring light. We will not be able to bring flavor into people's lives. There will be no impact. Compromise is a dangerous, dangerous place. I think one of the best examples of compromise is Balaam. Balaam in the new, in the old in, in the Old Testament in the Book of Numbers. You should read his story. It's very interesting. I was reading it, and the first thing that came to my mind is he compromised. Balak, the Moabite, comes and says, "Come and curse Israel." Balaam says, "Let me pray about it." He goes to God. God, can I curse Israel? God says, "No ways. You can never curse Israel." Then Bala comes again. We'll give him more, double the money. Come and curse Israel. Balak says, "What? I'll go pray about it." He goes and prays. Now, God, can we? Can I go curse Israel? No, you cannot do this. You cannot curse Israel. He started compromising in his life. Then he said, "Okay, I will teach." Towards the end of that whole story, he did not curse. He did not bless. He did not. He went. Sorry, he went and blessed Israel. Balak was angry and said, "Why did you bless? I called you to curse." But we know what Balaam did. If you read the story carefully, he taught Israel how to curse itself. Meaning, he told Balak, "You send your Moabite women. Once they go there, the Israelites will fall in sin. And it's an automatic curse upon themselves. You will defeat them." He compromised his calling. There are many stories, but this is one story that stands out. If he had just said, "I cannot do this," and stayed in his house, everything would have changed. Imagine the New Testament says, "Don't be like Balaam." Jude says that. Revelation says that. But he was a prophet of God. He didn't curse Israel. New Testament saying, "Don't be like Balaam." Why? He compromised. He tried to, you know, make God feel that okay, you know, anything works. He was trying to change God's plan. Doesn't work that way, right? We must not compromise. Uh, we must learn to, you know, stand for what our belief system is. Provide biblical response to current issues. First Corinthians fourteen eight. For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? Now, in a day and age that we are living in, there will be many questions. There will be many issues that will be rising up, right? Youth. Teens will have many things that are coming up. Our answers must be clear, precise, and not with uncertain sound. Now, this may not be easy, but this is something that we must develop, and something that I'm trying to learn is to learn the ability to answer questions with the Word of God. Now, I can give answers, but I must be able to, you know, defend with the Word of God. And so. I want to learn to do this, right? So, because it's very important as leaders, we we provide solutions through the problems that we are facing, people are facing around us. Go back to God's word and defend it by God's word, not just random answers we we are giving, right? So, how can there are practical ways that we can help by doing this? Ensure teaching on the pulpit is sound, strong, and uncompromising. Pulpit. Preaching should be strong. Two, address real life problems and issues. Remember, we talked about faith and science in twenty. I think it was twenty three, twenty two or twenty three. There's a sermon on faith and science, and uh, now we're talking about revelations. Right? We talked about the book of Acts. Uh, so we talk about issues that are happening, right? Current day issues, and uh, empower, encourage believers to live by the truth. Uh, Engage, encourage believers to engage in the society meaningfully. Encourage believers to take up opportunities 
of uh, that bring kingdom values and kingdom perspectives now challenges complex issues may arise now some places we need to really get in deep hear from god and be able to answer good questions popular opinion may grip people now this is an opinion one person may have or you know sometimes people see watch a lot of things on social media and there's a certain kind of opinion you know if a pastor dresses in a certain way nowadays the youth want to dress in that way why because they they do that right and i mean there's nothing wrong about it what's happening is it's starting off with the dress or the clothes and then it becomes whatever they are teaching whether it's right or wrong then it goes into the appearance then you begin to really watch what they are speaking and then we believe it now if it's a false doctrine we are in trouble and then as pastors and leaders now they are sitting in india and watching a sermon that's happening somewhere in a different country but the damage is being made so then as pastors and leaders we have to you know really be able to get people to understand the word what is the word saying we're not telling them hey don't listen to them listen to me no but we bring out the word what does it say right uh, the voice of unco of compromising christian leaders may be louder than others but we will have to stand for the truth right so as the local church we are the truth we are the pillar of truth if we are not strong enough as pillars we will crumble and fall and that's not what god wants right now as a local church we are raising up people make sure that the word of god that is being taught and preached is is making the 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 church the local church strong right so many of us will go back to our hometowns we're part of the church there will be lot of things lot of events conferences all of that is there but in all these things right make sure the word of god is being taught don't be ashamed of the word right now if you're having a youth meeting don't worry about what the youth may feel make it engaging make it interesting yet don't compromise with the truth if you're ministering in a cell group make it engaging make it in a way that you know they understand use a lot of examples but don't compromise on the truth right on a regular sunday service make the service nice right good to have all you know good sound system lighting led screen all that is good but don't compromise on the truth that is the word of god all right so we must always keep this in mind let's get into chapter 11 it's a it's a it's kind of a short chapter but we'll just quickly go into this we should be able to finish this right the local church this is the fourth aspect okay what is the first one the local church check your books it's all right the local church is the go back to your if you go right in front on your contents page yes go ahead first one is the local church is the body of Christ two is the family of God three the pillar of truth fourthly the local church is an army now look at this you've got family and then you got army it's like opposite no family is love care army is attack right now let's read a few uh, scriptures here the arm when we say army we engage in spiritual warfare we are not fighting against each other okay the army means we are engaging in spiritual attack so philippians 2:25 yes can anyone read and also we'll read first uh, timothy both those verses philippians 2:25 yet i considered it necessary to send to you uh, epaphroditus my brother fellow worker and fellow soldier but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need first mm. timothy 118 this charge i commit to you son timothy 
according to the prophecies previously made concerning you that by them you may wage the good warfare yeah read the next one sir first timothy 6:12 fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses all right so we see that in all three verses and there are plenty more verses but in all these three verses you see the aspect of warfare or fighting right? philippians he says be a fellow soldier in timothy first timothy 118 he says wage the good warfare and again first timothy 612 he says fight the good fight of faith so what are some of the aspects as an army what is it that we want to see the local church be right a sense of spiritual militancy both at individual levels as believers and as a local church body as believers as a look as as believers right we must be able to resist and fight the devil that is our personal battle i cannot come and fight your battles so we have the song this is how i fight my battles how do we fight we get down on our knees we pr we pray we go back to god's word we fight our battles god may give us different kinds of battles to fight but on a spiritual level each one of us must learn how to fight our own battles right then as a local church we need to live in this sense of spiritual militancy we are in a spiritual conflict right now the devil will come with a lot of temptations he may have different kinds of ways to tempt us we thank god in ephesians 6 he says we use the shield of faith that will quench every fiery dart of the wicked one so there's a sense of spiritual militancy do you see military soldiers just you know wandering about their minds just blank just looking do you see them that way they're on high alert especially you know if you go up in to the line of control that's one of the most active places uh, of militancy there you know soldiers can be sleeping with their guns the moment you touch the gun they they wake up or you just touch them they wake up because of spiritual mili they they they're ready for attacks they're ready to attack they're ready for attacks as well now just like that the enemy is like a roaring lion trying to devour have you seen lions and especially how they take their prey very careful they're hiding behind a bush right they'll be hiding they'll just be watching and they you know if there's a deer that's running around they don't go, just go and jump on it they're watching they're watching its every move is it going to rest there is is it still thirsty they're watching they're watching from a distance and when the time is right the usually the lions see the patterns of their prey how they go where they go what kind of way they run now the lions and especially lions tigers they know that the deers are very fast right they have the ability to just skip and move about very fast so they know they have to be on top shape to get a deer elephants may be easier to get giraffes may be a little easier but deers are very difficult to be top shape now as a local church we must understand the devil is like a roaring lion now in our own lives as well he will see areas in our life which is weakness and he will target that weakness that is why we need one the holy spirit two we need to put on the armor of god and three we need to be in the word of god if not it is very easy for the devil to trample over us you understand right so as a local church the devil can also come and infiltrate within the church ephesians 4:27 is very nice it says nor give place to the devil that means this is the chair don't let him to sit even in this small place he'll say this much is enough 
Oh, there's no place. No, no, I'll manage. You don't worry. You know, this one, this one is enough. It's enough. I'm fine. Then slowly you'll notice that I have fallen down and he's sitting in the chair. What happened? I don't know. I just gave him a small place in the chair. He's taken it up, taken it up, and then I'm I'm he's pushed me down and he's sitting. He's taken control. That's what will happen. So we give no place for the devil. We stop fighting with each other and focus on our real enemy, who is the devil. I love what Paul writes in Ephesians 6:12. He says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. The devil has schemes, but we must, be, we must not be unaware of his schemes. We know his schemes. He's using the same scheme. Which scheme? In the garden, did God really tell you not to eat of this fruit? Same thing he's telling now. Did God really say that uh, the blood of Jesus will cleanse you? Did really God call you for ministry? Look at you, how you are. Same scheme. Nothing has changed. Right? It's the same thing. So we must be aware of it. The battle for souls is a spiritual battle. So knowing it's a spiritual battle, how do I, as a pastor or a leader, Train up people to fight that battle. Can a person, can I just go now next, for example, next month I decide I want to join the army. Can I go and I say, okay, uh, I want to join army. They'll say, okay, what can I do 10 rounds? By the time I finish one round, I would have fallen down. Oh, I'm tired. Say, so you can't join the army. Why? I've got the height. You've got the height. One is you, you're not strong enough. Two, you're not fit enough. You need to be physically fit. Three, you've not done any kind of training. How can you join the army just like that? No, you can't join the army. So, uh, so we must understand that if I have to join the army, I should be trained for it. So if I am sending people to fight a good fight of faith, I must train them on how to use the, you know, the weapons that God has given. Uh, a, a soldier is trained how to use their gun. They don't get up and uh, then when they're 10 years old, start using the gun. They are trained to use it. How, how to use it, when to use it, everything. They're trained. So as believers, we train each other in spiritual warfare. We train them. We tell them, hey, this is how you must pray. This is how you must uh, you know, fight your battles. Remember that we are armed and dangerous. God has given us spiritual weapons that are mighty. And as believers, we are armed and dangerous to the enemy, provided we know how to use the weapons. Imagine, okay, think of this picture. Right? I'm a soldier and I'm sitting. I'm just getting some rest and I have my gun here. And then two, two enemies come, or one enemy is coming. And I see the enemy. Now, there are two responses. One is, I can take the gun and say, hey, don't come closer. I can attack you. Or I can just get scared and run away. Now, if I get scared and run away, the enemy is wondering, hey, he had a gun with him all this while. Maybe he doesn't know how to use the gun. That's why he ran away. He doesn't know how to use. He's just sitting there with the gun, but he doesn't know how to use it. Now, God has given us the weapons. We are sitting with the weapons. But when the enemy comes, if we run away, what does it show? That means we don't know how to use the weapons. So we need to learn to use the weapons and to understand that, hey, I am armed. I am dangerous because we have weapons. What are some of the weapons we have? The name of Jesus, the greatest weapon, the word of God, the Lord Jesus was tempted just like you and me. What did he say? It is written, it is written, it is written. He used the word of God. Three, the blood of Jesus and the completed work of the cross. When we talk about the cross, when we stand on the cross, the devil is already defeated. The book of Colossians says, he made a public spectacle of the enemy, destroying, disarming his power. 
right? Our position in Christ, are we a servant? Are we a son? What are we? Our position, right? We are seated with him in heavenly places. We are a child of God. We are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. That's who we are. The full armor of God is our, again, a spiritual weapon that we use. Now, Jesus, uh, Paul writes and he says, you put on the armor. We have to put it on. I cannot come and say, hey, please put on your helmet. No enemy can come anytime. Where's your shield? It's in my room. Where's your breastplate of righteousness? I, I forgot it's in my hometown. No, you have to have it all ready. You have to put it. And then when you're all ready and you put it, the enemy will come, you'll be able to fight. Otherwise, we cannot stand a chance against him. Right? Prayer and intercession. Prayer. Praying, see, I always say this. The devil is all, he's fine if you, you know, you go to church, come every Sunday. He's fine with it. The moment you decide to pray, the moment you decide to fast and pray or just pray, he will do all that he can to stop you from doing that. He'll bring distractions, he'll bring fear, he'll bring doubt, he'll bring work, he'll busyness, tiredness, lethargy, hunger, sleepiness, everything he'll try to bring the moment we try to pray. Because prayer is a weapon against the devil. It's a weapon. It's like taking a knife and cutting him into pieces. That's what it is. That's what prayer is. The devil doesn't like it when we pray. Then there's praise and worship. Again, powerful way of dealing with the enemy. Imagine something goes wrong. You're praising God. You're worshiping God. The devil is thinking, what's wrong with this guy? Remember in the book of Acts? Paul and Silas are in prison. What are they doing? Praising and worshiping God. Now the devil doesn't know what to do. I beat them up, I put them into prison, still they are praising. Over. Been, the enemy was destroyed that moment itself, he has defeated. Repentance and righteousness. Our right standing with God is a weapon. The devil will, the word Satan means accuser of the brethren. He's going to accuse. You did this, you did this, you did this. But you and I are the righteousness of God. Yes, I've done many mistakes. I've asked for forgiveness. And I'm washed by the blood of Jesus. So right now, I'm the righteousness of God. I have a right standing with the Father. That's, these are weapons that we use. right? So we'll stop here. And then next class, we will get into anointed for battle. right? Uh, just a quick thing before we close. Uh, for the next course, that is uh, BC 206, Ministry of the Evangelist, Pastor and Teacher, um, we will not have a class today. But I request you to please just uh, go back and read from whatever we have learned. And then we will meet for this class because I have uh, another task that has to be fulfilled. I'll finish that. So we will meet again on Friday for Ministry of the Evangelist, Pastor and Teacher. Is that okay? All right. Okay, so let's just close and pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for teaching us, Lord, from your word. And what a, what a joy it is to understand and know, Lord, that we are part of your kingdom, part of your church, oh God, your body. We are your, your family. We are part of, the, we are the pillar of truth, oh God. And now we are an army. Lord, empower us, equip us. Teach us to walk in these attributes as a local church and as individual believers. God, we thank you for teaching us. We come at this day into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So next session we won't have. We'll meet next Friday. Thank you, everyone.